This video was sponsored by Brilliant. All right, another one done, so let's go through it. So I just finished going through this textbook on abstract algebra, and this one took me about five months to complete. And it's a pretty long book, 33 chapters, nearly 600 pages. And technically at the time of making this video, I'm not totally done with the special topics, but I've learned plenty and needed to make a video. So first, I really like this class, definitely more than Real Analysis, which was the last book I went through, because like the problems didn't take two hours to go through each time, and I forgot what that was like to be done with a problem within a few minutes. So that was a nice change. And this class is unique in that I don't really have anything else to compare it to. I mean, it's a math class, so there's no physics problems or particle motion or anything like that. But this class does have applications to fields such as physics, chemistry, cryptography, which is talked about in this class, and plenty more. You learn three things for the most part. Three mathematical structures, groups, rings, and fields, which are all related, and they take some time to explain, so I'll do that in a sec. I have mentioned before this class has a lot to do with symmetry, the mathematics of symmetry, and symmetry shows up in physics, chemistry, board games, mathematics itself, and so on. So you kind of get the idea of how it can be so useful but there's more to it. Now this is a class you're required to take as a math major, but you'll see physics majors and even computer scientists take it as well. I just don't know if those are because it's required or they took it as an optional elective or maybe it depends on the school, but it's not just for math majors. And you can honestly take this pretty early on in college, I would assume, because there aren't many prereqs. The biggest one I would say was basic proofs. If you're comfortable with direct proofs, Proof by contradiction, contrapositive, induction, and if and only if, then you're pretty much covered. I would highly recommend some number theory background though, but you don't need too much. It's just that in abstract algebra, there's a lot of modular arithmetic and a lot of solutions or theorems, mostly in the beginning of the book, involve the least common multiple or greatest common divisor of some stuff. So if you know, for example, why like this has no integer solutions and why this does in relation to the greatest common divisors and also how to move things around in this modular arithmetic problem, you probably have enough background. Otherwise, maybe two chapters of a number theory book and you're good. Or just watch some YouTube videos. Then linear algebra is the other prereq, but I would argue you actually don't need it for the first 19 chapters of this book. Yes, it shows up, but if you just ignore the linear algebra examples and practice problems, you'll be fine. They only account for maybe 5% of problems, and the other 95% have nothing to do with linear algebra or matrices or anything like that. After chapter 19, you start to generalize vector fields and basis vectors, which they review, but it would be weird to attempt that without a linear algebra background. Okay, let's go for an explanation, and this will not be a deep dive, it will just be a very generic overview. Again, you learn three topics, groups, rings, and fields. They are all sets, like here's a set, the set of integers. Now, in order for a set to be a group, the most broad of the three, a few criteria have to be met. The main one I'll emphasize is that there has to be some operation, like addition in this case, that allows you to combine two elements in your set and get something out that is also in your set. So the set of integers is a group under addition because you can take any two integers, combine them with addition, and get a third. There are other reasons this is a group, but not important for this video. Because what is important to note is that groups don't care about what the operation is. Sure, it could be addition or multiplication, but the set of all permutations of, let's say, three objects forms a group using the operation of composition, basically applying one shuffle to another. Like applying this shuffle, which switches the first and second position, then this, which switches the second and third position, gives you this, just another permutation still in your set. I know that probably looks weird written out, but all we just did was took the original permutation, swapped the first two, and then swapped the last two, and we get another permutation. So for groups, operation doesn't matter. You just can't leave the set with that operation. Rings are just a little stricter. They are also sets, but the operations must be addition, subtraction, and multiplication. It can't be just anything now. So the set of integers is a ring as well. I can take any two elements, apply those three operations, and get another integer. 
A really big topic discussed in this book is polynomials, and the set of all polynomials with, let's say, integer coefficients also forms a ring. They combine through the three operations and still yield a polynomial with integer coefficients. And this happens a lot in this book, where you analyze polynomials but restrict what their coefficients can be and what can be plugged in. Like, this polynomial can be factored, as such, but if you restrict your world to only rational numbers, then this cannot be factored, because root 2 is irrational. So we say it's irreducible over the set of rationals. And while that seems strange to do, there are applications, which I'll show in a sec. Then lastly, fields are just a little stricter than rings. They are sets that require division on top of the three operations required for a ring. So, the four operations we're familiar with since elementary school. Thus, the set of integers is not a field, because although the first three operations work, you cannot take any two integers and divide them and get another integer. The set of rational numbers is a field, though. Same with the set of real numbers and complex numbers. Now, while there are three main topics, I kind of think of this class as groups, then rings and fields. Although they're related, since groups are much more general, they apply to a lot more, especially outside of math. Again, systems that involve symmetry often have underlying group structures. Rings and fields apply more to areas within math. There are applications within cryptography or coding theory, but the big ones, especially those covered in this book, would be like constructible numbers. If you were only given a straight edge, compass, and a unit length, could you, in theory, draw a line segment that has a length of exactly one half, or root 30, and so on, without just guessing? It must be exact. And this is a problem that heavily relies on the knowledge of fields. Or another topic related to fields would be proving there is no, quote, quadratic formula to solve for a fifth degree polynomial or higher. So as you can see, for rings and fields, you're mostly staying within math. Throughout this book, by the way, you really only do math problems. Although I mentioned other applications, don't expect to directly see any. You're just getting the foundations here. And it does get abstract. Like, can you think of any fields with a finite number of elements? I mentioned the rationals, real numbers, and complex numbers, but those are all infinite. However, there's an entire chapter dedicated to finite fields. So yes, they exist. And this is one area where you'd especially need modular arithmetic. And then, for example, you prove how the number of elements in a finite field must be prime or an integer power of a prime. These are the kinds of things you learn. And you can maybe see why number theory is important, with primes also showing up a lot. But it's not just, here are some definitions, now tell me what is a field or a ring and what isn't. Once you get these definitions, there are certain properties that reveal themselves that give you more intuition about what these are and how we can use them. Then something else I want to mention is that I know these seem very random. Like, couldn't anyone just make a definition and call it a ring, a field, a blah, 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 or whatever? Well, yes. But the thing is, it took time for these definitions to become what they are. And they became that way because they kept showing up within mathematics and even in other fields. They're defined how they are because they have proved to be useful. For example, I love the constructible numbers chapter of this book which came at the very end, but it put so much together. When I learned about construction in geometry, I found it so boring. Like, I just didn't care that you could cut a line segment in half or an angle in half. But when you look at this through the lens of abstract algebra instead of geometry, I found it to be really interesting. Because note that if two lengths are constructible, you can make them with a compass, ruler, and a unit length of one, then so is their sum. Just start the second length at the end of the first, and you get a plus b. But their difference is also constructible by going the other direction. Here's a minus b. And then using some clever triangle tricks, which you can do using a compass, it turns out the product and quotient of the two are also constructible. So if you're given a unit length of 1, then 1 is constructible, obviously but so is 2 and 3 and all integers. But now you know so is 1 half, 1 third, and so on, because quotients are possible. But how far can we take this? Like, is root 7 or pi squared constructible? Well, whatever the set of constructible numbers is, we don't know at first, we do know that take any two, you can apply these four operations 
and get something else in the set. Thus, the set of constructible numbers is a field. More specifically, it's a field that includes all rational numbers, but I will say, not all real numbers. Pi is not constructible, but root 2 is, as such. So we have a field in between the rationals and reals. And if you haven't had any exposure to this class, it might be tricky to think of any field in between the rationals and reals. And amazingly, finding that field has to do with finding solutions to polynomials that have only rational coefficients and a degree of some power of 2. I'm not going into depth here, as I hope this kind of creates some interest and maybe for some people some fear, but don't worry, you start at the very basics. And I mentioned this because if earlier you asked why would we care about polynomials that just have integers or rational numbers as coefficients? Why would we need to restrict our world to some specific set like that? Well, here you go. It actually has applications. Having a rigorous foundation of polynomial rings via abstract algebra allows us to gain a fundamental understanding of a construction, a topic that you would think is purely geometric, but in fact is not. I'm also going through an algebraic topology book right now, which takes topology and abstract surfaces and combines it with groups. So abstract algebra is a prereq. And very quickly learn how loops on a surface have a group structure, where the operation is concatenation. Like if I gave you two loops, one loop and another loop, and put them together by like just doing one then the other, technically you still have a loop because you start some spot and end at that same spot. So that's a loop. And thus you still get something in your set, the set of all possible loops. So you have this group structure and you can use that to prove certain topological theorems that are very visual, like borsuk ulam the, the theorem that says there are two points on Earth right now that are directly opposite of one another somewhere that have the same temperature and pressure. You can also use this to prove certain fixed point theorems. So there's some cool applications there, and that's one of the big reasons I wanted to go through abstract algebra, is because it's a prereq for some of those more advanced classes. And I personally find it really interesting to see two seemingly different subjects come together so nicely. Then in terms of difficulty, I honestly found this to be somewhere in the middle of the math classes I've taken. I don't even know how to make comparisons, but it wasn't the easiest and it wasn't the hardest. I never found myself like stuck on one specific section for weeks or anything like that. I just, and I didn't need any extra resources. I just had the book and I'd go through practice problems, reference the theorems back when I needed, and that was all I was really required to really learn the material. Some problems could be done in one minute, others took 10, and occasionally I had to take like an hour or two to figure something out. But those longer problems definitely were the exception, not the rule. So, I think that's about it. If you're gonna go into this class soon at university, I'd say honestly, brush up on some basic number theory, if anything, otherwise you're likely good to go. And I'll put a link in the description to the textbook that I used. It seemed like a pretty standard one used in university. And if you'd like to get an introduction to abstract algebra that's less rigorous and more focused on applications, there is a group theory course available on Brilliant that offers exactly that. Honestly, this is a great supplement even if you do go through the textbook because this course shows several applications that are not covered in the book, which give you more appreciation for what groups can do. For example, you see how looking at the group structure of different games reveals possible ending configurations. Notice again the symmetry of these boards, which is a good indicator that groups are somewhere to be found. I mentioned permutations before, but they dive further by taking a brief look at how groups apply to permutations and the mathematics of a Rubik's Cube. But the course does begin with the basics, just like a textbook. You start at geometric symmetries, how we can use rotations and reflections to form a group for different shapes. And it goes all the way to some more advanced topics, which dive more into the pure mathematics within group theory. So if you want to get started right now and support the channel, then go to brilliant.org slash Zachstar or click the link below, and the first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And with that, gonna end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.